Bible records John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and began to receive the revelation of Christ in Revelation chapter 1. And as he gets into chapter 2 and chapter 3, the addressing to the seven churches of Asia begin. And as we get to the end of chapter 3, beginning in Revelation 3 at verse 15, and going through verse 19, the church of Laodicea is brought up and discussed. The Bible talks about it in verse 14, and he says, Laodicea, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would rather thee be hot or cold. However, in verse 16, he says, So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He goes on to describe their works in verse 17, how they say that they are rich and increased with goods and have, a, have need of nothing. He says, knowing uh, that you're wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, white raiment clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy soul, that thou mayest see. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What do we need to do to grow? That's the next step. That, that as a congregation and as individuals, our process and in our New Testament Christianity for God is, how do I grow? How do I grow in my knowledge once I've been a Christian for 30, 40 years? I've, I've heard of the same things time and time again. I've, I've read through the Bible once a year for 20 years. You know, what, you know, the question arises, what much more can I learn? What much more can I do? As a congregation here at Union Grove that's been here for years, so before some of us were even thought of, or before some of our parents were even thought of, this congregation has been here. What do we need to do to make sure it's still here? What do we need to do to grow? You know, as, as you look at the, the numbers that are posted uh, Sundays and Wednesdays, and you look around, we're missing a lot of people. Uh, at least in the three years I've been here, there's been people that used to come here that are no longer coming here. Now, I'm not talking about the death, the ones that, uh, I'm more so looking at the ones who have moved away, the ones who are no longer coming to service. And, and you look and say, well, in number or numerically, we may not necessarily be growing, but as a congregation, from my perspective, at least in three years, we've grown a lot. We've grown a lot closer as, as, a, as a church family. We've grown in spirit a great deal. We've grown in knowledge, and we've added some individuals to our great family. However, we can't stop. we got to grow. You know, I made a joke. Uh, I was talking to someone and they asked how the church was doing and how everything. They said, are you growing? I said, well, with all these Sunday meals, we're certainly growing, but may not be in the best way sometimes. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty funny joke. And I got a few chuckles, so I'll, I'll put a check mark by that as a good joke to use again. But uh, we're growing. <coughs> as a church, are we doing enough? And as individuals, can we do more? Those are two points we're looking at. I want to look at growing as a church and growing as individuals. Not all congregations of the Lord are prepared to grow in number and in spirit. I want the big numbers. We, we want to see the big increase in population. However, if the in spirit is not accompanying the in numbers, are we really doing what we should be? Consider the church at Laodicea. Notice what they're saying. We're rich. We have a lot of goods. We have everything. He says, you're wretched. You're miserable. You're naked. Uh, this perspective or you know, perception of we have a lot going for us whenever in all reality we're not doing a whole lot of nothing oftentimes hurts a congregation. For the congregations to grow, we must look beyond. And this is not excluding, but including more. We must look beyond our evangelistic efforts. We need to do the Great Commission. Amen, absolutely. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. As commanded to us in Matthew 28, Mark 16, and other places, we need to do that. Absolutely. But in order for the church to grow, it goes even more with that. We can evangelize and evangelize. But if we're not making the application to ourselves and to the members here of what we're teaching and preaching, what good are we doing? Oftentimes it brings in hypocrisy to the mix and saying, well, they're... they're Preaching it, but are they living it? Are they practicing what they're teaching? To have real enduring growth, we must be ready to grow. Number one, as a congregation. So what can we do? 
One of the first things as a congregation we must do to promote growth is offer an assembly that edifies. Well, what does that mean? Well, once again, getting under that topic of discussion of is our worship to God acceptable and proper? Are we edifying one another and praising the one true and living God? You look there in John 13, and Jesus makes a point to bring up in John the 13th chapter to his apostles and disciples there. He said, men will know you based off of two things. Do you remember what they were? All falling under the same category of the same four-letter word. John 13, beginning at verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, as if you love one another. So really, going back to that point that is just hammered and hammered and hammered and talked about constantly, is are we showing true Christian love to everyone? Oh, I don't say that. Well, look once again, John 13, verse 33, or John 13, verse 35. By this shall all men know. That you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Brethren, the love showing in the congregation or in the assembly must be, must be to everyone. It must be evident. It must be visual. We have to be able to see it. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Whenever we show this love and it's extended to everyone, it should draw us closer to God. As was made mention to those in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, near the end of verse 25. Let's, let's turn over there this morning. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, looking at verse 25. The secrets of his heart made manifest. So falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Whenever the assembly edifies... Love is shown to the brethren and to all of those in the assembly. And number two, it draws us closer to God. But at least it should. And at least that's the hope. Now remember here at Corinth, they were using their gifts and the interpretation and the tongues and the spiritual gifts. They were using them incorrectly. And he says, if therefore the whole church come together in one place and I'll speak with tongues. And there come in those that are unloaned, unbelievers. Will they not say that you're mad? But, we go to verse 25, he says, With the secrets of his heart made manifest, so then falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. There's a way to do things with what's been given to us, that is God's word, correctly and incorrectly. So based off those who are faithful and the unbelievers that come here and worship with us, as far as the faithful goes, we have to make sure that what we're doing is approved of by God, edifying for the, for the individuals and glorifying to God, Matthew 5, verse 16. <coughs> Not all congregations provide the right spiritual environment conducted for worship and spiritual growth. Proof, right? 1 Corinthians 14 at 26 now. Is that saying that all not all Lord's churches are acceptable? It's not what we're saying at this point. What we're saying is, is whenever the Lord's church comes together, there is an absolute specific way they are to worship and to conduct themselves. If we fall out of that, and that is God's word, God's command, can we say that we're worshiping correctly? Absolutely not. So 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, come together, every one of you has a song, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, an interpretation, let all things be done unto what? An edifying. It should be edifying for the individuals there. You ever looked at the new converts of a congregation and seen how dependent they are on spiritual nourishment provided by the assembly? Those that have done it for so long? Some of you, and I'm not being mean whenever I say this, some of you have been in the Lord's church longer than some of us have been alive. Once again, I'm not being disrespectful at all. That's... That's, that's, if I can praise you of one thing, excellent job on that. We need help from you. You've endured this, this battle, this walk, this fight, this race for 20, 30, 40 plus years. We're just getting started. So the spiritual we need uplifted by your strength and your wisdom from God. So whenever we look in Hebrews chapter 10, 
we're going to notice something. One of the best ways, whether you believe it or not, one of the best ways to help and give spiritual nourishment to a new convert, number one, to consider our works, and number two, is to be here when the doors are open. We're trying to get someone to realize the significance and the importance of converting and giving their life to God whenever we say we're doing it, yet whenever it's time to be here, we're, we're not existent. Friends, that's not how it should be. Notice verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We need help, verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The faithfulness and the exhorting and the provoking unto good works does not help if it is just on Sunday and Wednesday. Well, preacher, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's when the assembly is, right? I can't argue with that. The assembly is then. But what happens whenever you run into them on a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday, or Saturday? How edifying and encouraging are we? How often does Bible come up in those daily conversations versus the Wednesday and Sunday conversations? Friends, the edification and the spiritual nourishment that's the new converts need or those who are weak and unlearned or ignorant in the faith that they need is not a simply two-day-a-week job. It's a daily thing. It's an encouraging thing. They need, we all need help. Excited by their newfound faith, anxious to grow quickly, they attend all the services of the church. And what do they find? Do they find half-hearted services? Do they find individuals to be hypocritical and two-faced? Once again, I believe we need to edify, we need to build up, we need to encourage. I agree. That's what we're trying to do this one. I'm not trying to badmouth anybody. If you fall into these categories, realize the sin of it and how you can change that and help the church grow. If we're serious about growing, then those who lead in our assemblies will take their responsibilities and their tasks seriously. Coming prepared to serve the role that they said that they made the commitment and obligation to serve, to do it correctly. When we go to, in remembrance of what Christ done for us and prepare to take of the Lord's Supper, we need to realize who it's for, Christians. We need to realize what it's for. To be faithful and worship God. And we need to realize the significance of it. If we're not doing that, we need to prepare better. We need to do it better. Whenever we sing hymns, you need to know what you're singing and praising God for. It's not just another worthy of praise Sunday. Todd sings it a lot. And Todd, I'm not bad about him. Love the hymn. Because you know what? Whenever you sing it, what are you saying? That God is worthy of the praise we give him. Amen, absolutely. Sing it every Sunday. Because he is. But you need to understand what you're doing. You need to take the role, the position, the work that you're doing for the Lord serious. Why? Because he's worthy of it. And because those who don't know as much, once again, not being mean or belittling, they need the encouragement and the reminder of the significance and the importance of it. Why would you do something halfway? What good's it doing? One, it's not doing you as an individual good because you're not fully serving God. And two, it's not letting that bright light shine before me in Matthew 5. That they may see your what? Good works and do what? Glorify Father, which is in heaven. Once again, I'm not being mean, friends. I've been guilty of it as well. Not taking the seriousness of it or or halfway doing something. It's not the way things ought to be done. How do we gather or sow and nurture new members? That's the next point. We're looking at growth as a congregation, and we see that our assembly, number one, has to be correct. Because whenever we have open doors and an open invitation to all, when they get here, for lack of better words, they need to see how it needs to be done. Number two, once we get them here, what's the next step? Friends, we've got them in the door before. Those of you that are listening here or online, at your faithful, the congregation, the faithful words church you attend, you've probably got them in the door as well. But guess what? The next question is, have you kept them there? It's done them good. They've heard the word, friends. The next thing is they need to keep hearing it. They need to be here. So how do we gather and nurture new members? This is really going to help us in our striving to keep 
the members we have and to encourage the youth as well. And as a valuable as our assemblies may be, they may not always be adequate by themselves. And we need to realize that. We also need to come to the understanding that babes in Christ often require special attention and nurturing. Whenever we look at the comparison of a babe in Christ and an infant in, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, and Peter brings it up as well as we desire the milk of the word to grow. Notice Hebrews 5 beginning at verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Does a baby not require a whole lot more attention than an adult? In most scenarios, 99.8% of it, you would say yes. They have to have so much food. They have to have so much of this, so much that. They have to have a new doctor every 30 minutes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? You, you move on down the list and say they require special attention. But as they grow and develop, what do we do? We, we still pay attention to them. We still encourage, but we get ready for the next group of babies that are to come, Right? Because we notice the growth that's mentioned in verse 14 now of Hebrews 5 strongly belongs to them that are of full age. Well, preacher, what happens if I don't get to full age? We didn't use the meal cry. Because notice now verse 12, we're going to kind of flip-flop a little bit. Verse 12, for when the time you ought to have been teachers, you have, one that need, you have the need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become of such as need of milk and not strong meat. Now we're going to step on some toes with this next point. Brethren, if we're not growing, we're steadily decaying. And though the decay as individuals is very serious, we have to realize what that decay is doing to the congregation. For me, decaying and not growing, I'm now taking time from other individuals to bring them back to me to teach me again when I ought to be teaching and help growing. And now the church is suffering because of my lack of diligence and Bible study and faithfulness. It's a, it's a big cycle. It all works together kind of like a watch. You remove one piece and what happens? It doesn't work properly anymore, if at all. That's what's happening to the Lord's church. It's not growing properly in all areas. So whenever we revisit things, nothing wrong with that. We're missing out on things we need to be focusing on. Notice with me Romans, the 15th chapter. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Here's where we, get in, here's where we really hit on the responsibility of individuals. Notice verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Okay, we always look at Romans 15 and 4, right? But whenever we focus on what he's saying here in verses 1, 2, and 3, those who are strong need to help bear the infirmities of the weak. He says the same thing to the church of Galatia. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let every one of us please his neighbors for the good to his edification. Are we helping? And once again, it's nothing wrong with it. Are we helping the weak grow as strong brethren? If we're not, we see how the church is not growing. Or we see why, rather. <coughs> Number two, let's look now at what we must do as individuals. As a congregation, the two points we wanted to get across uh, th this morning in order to grow is number one, make sure our worship and our assembly is correct. Make sure that those that are in those teaching roles, those worship roles, make sure they understand the seriousness of their responsibility and they take it with great seriousness. Number two, whenever we get the new members here, we need to gather them, obviously, and we need to teach them as a congregation. Now, when looking at individuals, number one, for an individual to grow, their relationship with God must be strong. And if it is not strong, what do we say? We will make it strong. Strengthen, strengthen it. Why is this so important? Others must see us in the blessings of walking with God, not simply the pride of knowing about the Lord. Uh, we, we, we read in the Bible of those acknowledging God, but simply not believing in Him or obeying Him. 
Did they do any good? The Bible even says that the devils believe in, in, in fear and tremble of God, but they do nothing with their belief, right? And, and we say, if you have a belief of God, but do not follow it with obedience, you're no better than the devils or the infidel. So today, as individuals, if my relationship with God is not a continual growth and walk, it is a continual death and decay. Let's make, let's, let's give an example, right? How many of you brush your teeth every day? Why? Because you got nasty breath and you need to clean it. Amen? I mean, oh, no, that's not it. That's one of the reasons I do it. I, I got some of the awfulest morning breath, but that's not the point we're trying to make. If you don't brush your teeth, what happens? Do they all fall out the next day? No. Well, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Some of you might, might have worse. I got some pretty bad teeth. I make the joke, my teeth point every which way but straight. It's all right. I live with it. I'm used to it. Don't bother me a bit. Brush, I still brush my teeth. Still try to take care of them. We're trying to get it into a, to Reese that he needs to brush his teeth every day, twice a day, so they grow and they're healthy and they're strong and they're clean. Because if you continue on that road of not brushing your teeth, what happens? Cavities. Cavities develop holes. Holes develop tooth decay, and then eventually they just fall out. Right. So if we're not nourishing and properly taking care of our teeth. What, we get cavities, we get problems with them, and they die if we don't fix the problem. Well, what about our spiritual relationship and our soul with God? If I'm not tending to its every need and making sure it's you know, nourishing, what's it doing? It is most definitely decaying. I can't skip a day. I can't afford to miss a day with this relationship. Turn with me now oh, as Paul brings it up in Philippians chapter 3. Obviously, he doesn't use my same great point of the teeth to decay. But he makes mention here in Philippians chapter 3 that no matter how strong our relationship with God is, we can always improve. Uh, Philippians 3, beginning at verse 12. And he says, Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting or neglecting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What we must recognize is the individual strengthening that relationship with God and pressing towards that mark, it is a daily thing. We have to neglect those things behind us and put forward to that which is before us. Peter acknowledges it in 2 Peter chapter 1. Remember? The, the adding of everything. If you don't, let's turn over there. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, right? And besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, temperance patience, patience godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what's said in verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. Peter says you need to be adding, you need to be growing, you need to be continuing. But the one that's not doing this is missing the point. He's blinded and he needs to remember because he has forgotten what God has done for him, right? Notice what he says, verse 9. He that lacketh these things, so the one who's not adding this, he can't see far off, he's blind, he's forgotten that God purged him from his old sins. And in order to have the sins purged, you had to be baptized into Christ, you had to show obedience, and you dedicated your life, Galatians 2, verse 20. So you said, I'm going to live for God, therefore growing. If you're not doing these things, friends, you're not growing. It, it, it's that simple. Number two, in order to grow as individuals, we must strengthen ourselves. Number two, we must strengthen our relationship with one another. A point that we talked about as a congregation, as a whole, how our relationships need to be good. But as individuals, once again, as he mentions there in John 13, 34, and 35, this is how individuals look in from the outside and say they follow after Jesus or they are disciples in Christ because they carry love for one another. A strong network of Christians is essential to the growth and the nurture of new Christians. 
a, a separated and divided congregation such as Corinth was in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 cannot accomplish what God has put forth for the church to do. It's impossible. If we're not working together, we're working against each other, and can anything be done? What does the Bible say? The Proverbs writer say, a home that's divided against itself shall what? Shall fall, right? It cannot stand. Well, whenever we're looking at the home or the church of God, the family, if we're divided amongst ourselves, can we stand? Can we grow? Can we evangelize? What's the answer to all of those? No, we can't. Excuse me. Turn with me. If you're still there in 2 Peter, flip over to 1 Peter 1. Excuse me. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to look at verse 22. You know, you know, a lot of us have strong relationships with individuals. Brother Kevin and I, we've been friends for a long time. You know, bless, bless my heart. I put up with him for many many years. Brother Chris has been friends with us for a very long time. Bless his heart. He's put up with both of us. And then he's added Todd to the mix. I don't see how he's still got hair on his head. Some of us have great relationships with one another. But I'm going to use a personal experience and I don't think Brother Chris will mind. Every now and then, we run into a, a bump in the road. We, we run into a hiccup, a disagreement, a slight argument, and it, no hatred, no no bad thing there, but sometimes it's just too caring, loving, energetic people disagreeing on a topic that it's okay. And, and, it, and it happens, but notice, even though as strong as our relationship can be, or maybe yours can be with another individual, there's always room for improvement. First Peter chapter 1 at verse 22, the Bible says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. We can grow. We can do better. Paul exhorted those of the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 9 and 10 to do the same thing. Peter wrote to the Christians in a, in a general way here by inspiration of 1 Peter 1 at verse 22. Uh, let, let's get ready to close, friends. You, you, you've given me a lot of attention. I appreciate it. As individuals, another way that we can grow is developing relationships with the lost. We have to be careful here, right? Uh, as Paul told those at Corinth, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt a good way of living or good morals, for Corinthians 15 at 33. Whenever you and I go to develop relationships with the lost, Number one, we ask the question, why is this so important? Well, as we're told in Matthew 5 and verse 16, we need to let our light shine to bring as much value and glory to God as possible. The right example can prepare people to receive the word. Peter makes mention of that in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. Uh, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversations coupled with fear. Simply without the word, but based off the good Christian living of the home, the Bible makes the point that individuals can come to a knowledge and an understanding of what God would have people to do. Based off how we act, how we live, and how we conduct ourselves. So having a relationship with individuals who are lost and separate and apart from God, being a good Christian person, can help that relationship a lot. Relationships can be lost uh, with the lost can serve as a basis for continued with relationships with them that are saved. We must always be on the lookout for new relationships with the lost. Simple hospitality goes a long way. Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. But in order to be useful to the master, friends, that being God, I have to do what is right. I have to strive for perfection, if you will. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we read in our morning reading here and we're finally to it. I didn't know if I was going to make it to it this morning. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, the Bible says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Flee youthful lusts, Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of pure heart.
Friends, to be useful to God, an individual must be prepared. Ready for the master's use, following after the things that God would see us follow after. And it's not just for individuals. When, when looking at our first point this morning and as the idea of the congregation, the congregation needs to be ready for the master's use. We need to be following after righteousness, striving for perfection and, and godliness and holiness in the eyes of God. And if we look back. In Revelation chapter 3, we looked at Laodicea. Let's take a peek just real quick at Philadelphia. Revelation 3 to 8, and the last one will be yours. Just as the Lord was willing to provide an open door for the church of Philadelphia, the same thing is given to us. Revelation 3 to 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it, for thou hast, had, thou hast a little strength. And has kept my word and has not denied my name. The church at Laodicea was indifferent. They were lukewarm. They couldn't decide if they really wanted to serve God or if they really didn't want to. So they were in the middle. They said, we might do it now and we might not do it later. The church of Philadelphia had an open door and they kept it open by staying with God. Friends, we have an open door today. We have a, this wonderful, wonderful message to get out to the lost and dying world given to us by God. And as individuals and as a congregation as a whole, we have an obligation to be useful for the master in evangelizing and growing together spiritually and helping the lost. Do we really want to grow? Do we really want to see the church universally or locally here at Union Grove grow? As a physical body or alternative to growth is gradual death and, de and decay. The simple question this morning is, do you want to be like Laodicea or Philadelphia? Personally, if I may, I want to be more in this regard, in Revelation 3.8, I want to be more like Philadelphia. I want the open door to be presented and I want to, as a congregation and personally as an individual, be able to keep that door open by pleasing God and being ready for His use. We sing the hymn, Here Am I, Send Me, right? Talking about evangelism, whenever God has a work that needs to be done, Lord, here am I, send me, I'm ready to do it. We sing another hymn, Who at the door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demand, and whose is the voice I hear? Talking about God standing there, or Jesus being there ready for that door to be opened, for the invitation for him to be there with us, for us to abide with him in faithful obedience and to strive to show righteousness in his name. Friends, that's the goal. As a congregation and as individuals, I want to be faithful to God in both regards. And I know you do too, or at least I pray you do. If you're sitting here this morning and you're ready to give your life to Christ through obedience to his word, the invitation is yours. You gotta listen to what God's word says. There is no sinner's prayer. There is no biblical foundational evidence of asking Jesus into your heart and finding salvation. Friends, it's just not there. Biblically, based off what God's word says, it says you must start with faith. That faith comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10 verse 17. Based off of that, you develop a belief of Jesus Christ being the Son of God to be pleasing unto God, Hebrews 11, verse 6. You turn from your evil way and your sinful way of living and present your bodies acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service, Romans 12, 1, and Luke 13, 3. We call it repentance. The Bible calls it repentance. We make that good confession by mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before me and so that he does it before the Father, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. Realizing that if we don't, we are denying him and we will be denied before the Father comes that day. Based off that, we became a proper candidate for baptism. We're ready to enter the watery grave. Putting that old man of sin to death, Romans chapter 6, and arising to walk in the newness of life, having our sins purged, ready to give our life to Christ, Galatians 2, verse 20. To be faithful unto death, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, James 1 at verse 12, to receive the breath, blessing and the promise of eternal life. Maybe you're sitting here and you've done those things. You're like, preacher, I've done it, but I've fallen away. I've left the one that loved me first. I became lukewarm, indifferent. I became lazy, slothful, and I realize that now I don't want to come back home. The invitation is yours.
Please come down and see how we stand. As I found time.